welcome to the Speaking of Jazz podcast series with Manny Kellogg in association with Music Tribes Unite News. Now let's get started. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Woods. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Talking to you, I'm going to be okay. Man, I'm so excited to be able to have this conversation with you. Let me first let our, our guests know just who I have uh, with me this evening. I have the wonderful, the incomparable pianist. He's a, he's a uh, arranger, he's a writer, a, con a conductor, and also he's a poet. The fabulous Mr. Woody Wood. Man, how you doing? You still swinging? Let's talk. I, I, well, you know, I want to talk uh, and, and wish we were swinging at the same time. You know, I know that. <laughs> Man, you know, I, I'm, I'm just much as as much as we have worked together. I don't think that uh, we've ever really talked about some little little things like, uh, you know, where you're from and how you got started, some of your influences. So I'm going to just kind of stand out the way and just uh, that you share that with us. Well, now, uh, how I got started. Um, now, I guess I've liked music all my life. Uh, I interviewed my father uh, in the early 90s okay. and asked him when he knew that I might be a musician. He said, well, I always thought you were going to be one. And blew my mind because I didn't know it. But he he uh, said that he, he thought I was always pretty musical. But uh, in the third grade, I actually wanted to be Manny Kellogg. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I'm telling you now because I saw a red drum set in the, the music room of uh, Russell Elementary. On uh, and I told them I wanted to play the drums. They said, "No, you got to be in the fourth grade before you can play the drums." And uh, my parents uh, bought a house out in Compton uh, before the fourth grade came. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to play a, an instrument at my new school in Compton, and I said, "Yeah, I want to play the drums." They said, oh, we don't have any drums. <laughs> they said, we've got clarinets and flutes and something else. And I wasn't interested in those. I wanted to play the drums. So uh, I told my mother, I said, I want to play the drums, but they don't have no drums. She said, well, I like the flute. Tell them you want to play the flute. I said, OK. So the next day I went back to school told them I wanted to play the flute. They said, oh, we don't have any more flutes. <laughs> we have clarinets. And I said, well, what's a clarinet? And they said, well, it's like the flute. You're going to like it. And they brought out this ugly looking silver metal clarinet. <laughs> and I, I thought it was very ugly, but that's all they had. And uh, I started with the clarinet, and I kind of liked it. I learned a few little tunes, and finally I I told my parents, I said, I, I like to play the clarinet, but it's just so ugly. And uh, <laughs> I said, I need a real clarinet, one of the black ones. And uh, I don't know if you remember Southern California Music Company used to be downtown. <laughs> on Hill and 7th uh, in LA. And we went down there and the man had a clarinet and uh, he said, uh, my mother or somebody asked how much it cost and he said $75. And my mother turned to me and she said, boy, do you know how much $75 is? <laughs> and I said, no ma'am, because I didn't. I didn't know nothing about how much money it was. And uh, I think they paid a dollar or a dollar and a quarter a week for me to get that clarinet. And uh, that's, that's, that's what started me off. Uh, 
what got me really interested, we had a family that moved next door to us when I was in the fourth grade. And every one of their children, his five children, all of them could play the piano and played another instrument too. Yeah. Two of them, two of the kids was in uh, the youth orchestra uh, in LA. And listening to them play, because they played the piano and these other instruments. One played cello, one played violin, one played guitar. That's what really inspired me uh, until I got into a junior high school and and found out that I didn't know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I found out how green you really were. Huh? That's right. I, 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 I don't even know if I was green. I might have been yellow or something uh, <laughs> at that point uh, because music was neither an art nor a science to me uh, when I started. I just played whatever they asked me to play. And I uh, got to junior high school and that's when I discovered a lot of what music is really about. Yeah. Uh, the science, the soul, the math, uh, the feeling, uh, because when I got to Bret Hart uh, in LA, we moved back to LA from Compton. My teacher, Mr. Magruder, taught me more in the three years in junior, I was in junior high school than anything else. Uh, and uh, he asked me, uh, well, what do you play? And I said, clarinet. I said, we just finished the concert. Now, what I didn't understand at the time was the little music that we was playing for the concert <laughs> out of, uh, in, in the uh, sixth grade, uh, ba, ba, da, ba, da, ba, da, 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 that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I thought I was doing something. And he said, okay, well, play me something like uh, Flight of the Bumblebee. Oh, and wow. I didn't even... I didn't even know what Flight of the Bumblebee was. He said, okay, play me a C scale. I, I got on that. I could play a C scale. And uh, there was, besides me, 27 other clarinet players in the band. And he stuck me in the very last seat, in the very last row. I was clarinet number 28. <laughs> That's a and, long way back there. Oh, man, it was way in the back. I, I was almost on the back porch. <laughs> and uh, anyway, they had uh, these band books. And uh, they were the kind that you, you used to clip on to your instrument so that you could march. Well, right. I had now, he, he, he gave, us the, gave me a band book. I looked in the book. I'd never even seen the notes. That was on the paper. They was higher. I, I didn't know the clarinet went that high. And I didn't know how fast it went or nothing. And the first song we uh, were supposed to play was Thunder and Blazes. It took me weeks before I could play that song, before I even play at it. But I got to say, uh, John Magruder was the teacher's name. Mm -hmm. He, uh, his main instrument was upright bass. And he had a duo with a piano player uh, that they played around town. And he played hi-hat with his left foot and played bass at the same time. And the piano player played and sang. And, uh, so when I saw him do that, I said, oh, that's the music I want to play because they were playing jazz. Yeah, and uh, yeah. he, uh, they were short a tenor, uh, a second tenor player in the jazz band. He said, no, I want you to come uh, join the jazz, jazz band. And uh, I wasn't playing sax yet. I was playing uh, tenor parts on clarinet. Okay. Uh, and I didn't realize I should be playing them down an octave from where they were written because 
tenor saxophone play the octave lower. And uh, I didn't like playing it that way on my clarinet. But I got it. I, I started listening to Count Basie and uh, Duke Ellington in the arrangements that we had in the jazz band. And at the same time, my mother had a boyfriend named, whose nickname was Stereo Steve. And Manny, he had every jazz record that we could have wanted. I don't care who you name. Uh, early Charlie Parker, Diz, uh, all the big band cats, everything. And I'd listen to those every day and try to imitate some of the stuff that I heard. Yeah. And uh, I got God bless me. Uh, the cross the street neighbor uh, called me one day and said uh, on the phone when I was in the eighth grade. Yeah, I was in the eighth grade. He called me and said, uh, there's somebody over my house I want you to meet. meet. And uh, he said, uh, and bring your horn. And I said, okay. So I came over and by this time, I was playing tenor and clarinet, so I brought them both. And uh, who he introduced me to was Benny Carter. Mm -hmm. And I knew who he was, but I'd never seen him. I, you know, I just heard him on the records. So. Yeah. And Benny said to me, what are you doing with the clarinet? I said, well, I play sax and clarinet. He said, no, you need to play flute. He said the double for tenor is flute, not clarinet. Clarinet is the double for alto. Mm. And I went to school and checked out a flute. And over the summer, I learned how to play it, taught myself how to play it. And I discovered that that was really what I wanted to do, was play tenor and play flute. Those were the ones. And I, uh, during that same time, I, uh, was sick one day and I heard uh, Herbie Mann play a bossa nova on the radio. Cause mm -hmm. you remember the jazz station, K KKGO, uh, KABC or uh, KBCA or something was the name then. And he played a uh, whistle while you work as a black, as a bossa nova. And I liked hearing it. And I figured that I could write an arrangement similar for the big band at, at, uh, at school. And that's what I did. Now, I didn't know exactly what I was doing. What I knew was what I wanted to hear, not exactly how to write it. So I had stems on the notes going in the wrong directions. <laughs> uh, I had uh, the bass part was supposed to go boom, boom, beady, boom, boom. Beep, beep. And I thought boom was the first note of the measure. Well, it wasn't. That was on beat four. Four, one, two, three, the, you know, that kind of thing. But I didn't know I, what I know. So I wrote it out and copied it. And next day went to school and uh, told Mr. Magruder, I said, uh, I, I, I wrote a, an arrangement. You think the, uh, uh, the band could play it? He said, you did. What? <laughs> And I showed it to him. He said, you wrote this? And I said, yes, sir. I, I, I wrote it. And uh, we tried to play it. And he told the bass player, who was a, a, a young girl at the time, too. Polly uh, was her name. She said, He said, now he put the, the bass line on the wrong note. Just move it one over and play it. And she played it. I said, yeah, that's the way it's supposed to sound. <laughs> and uh, he told me, he said, you got the stems going the wrong way and this and several other things. But it sounded good. Okay. It, it made sense. And that got me to write. I started trying to write all kinds of things. And for whatever reason, uh, which I still haven't figured out, uh, Mr. Magruder, every day it seemed like he'd tell me something. Uh, 
like he said, uh, he said, you want to get a better sound out of your horn uh, when you take your mouthpiece off when you put it together, stick the mouthpiece in a glass of water for five mm -hmm. minutes with the cap on and then take it off and then play. Change my life. <laughs> Change my life. Uh, since I was, I had moved myself up from, from the 28th clarinet <laughs> to the first clarinet. <laughs> moving on up. <laughs> uh, moving on up. Uh, I had to challenge my way up there because you could challenge anybody that was ahead of you to play something. And uh, so I, that's how I got up to uh, first clarinet. And uh, they let uh, the band play my uh, arrangement, A Whistle While You Work, uh, in one of the spring concerts. And um, what really attracted my attention too was each summer, uh, Mr. Magruder, the band teacher, and Mr. Rogers, the uh, drama teacher, would write a Broadway type musical. Mm. And we'd play it in the spring. It'd be the, the uh, concert band and the senior orchestra together, okay. right? Uh, with the drama class and the choir. And and so we would do a Broadway type production. Now that really knocked me out, really made me want to write something big, you know? Uh, and uh, I, uh, he gave me one other uh, thing that really moved me. He said, uh, uh, would you like to conduct the orchestra? And I said, yeah, I think so. And he said, what would you like to conduct? And uh, Ben-Hur was popular at the time, the movie. I remember and I really respected uh, the composer arranger, uh, Nicholas Rosa, uh, Italian fella who did uh, Ben-Hur and Spartacus and a bunch, all those kind of Romanists kind of move, uh, movies. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to conduct the scene where uh, Ben-Hur is riding around in his chariot and they're going slow around the whole uh, Coliseum. Uh, it was called uh, Parade of the Charioteers. And man, uh, again, my world changed because I said, oh, this is what I want to do. <laughs> and yeah. I want to lead the band. And uh, yeah, it was just one of those things that uh, that just took me to a whole nother level. I can't tell you that I was playing crazy good necessarily. I, I I could play a little bit, and as well as anybody in the in the band. Uh, but I I felt like writing and conducting uh, was what I needed to do. So well, I, I think you do them both very well, man. And the uh, only thing I can say is, you know, you just keep 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 doing what you're doing. You keep swinging. Keep now, swinging. On, 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 on that particular note, Mr. Woods, or should I say, Woody Woods? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm looking. I'm through. I've been looking through some of your notes here, man. Tell okay. me about the time that you played with the uh, Tootie Heat. Oh. My God, Lord have mercy. Well, as I told you, uh, my mother's boyfriend when I was in uh, junior high school, he uh, had every jazz album that you could think of. And so I used to read all those liner notes. I used to really get my information on musicians off the liner notes on the album which they yeah. don't do anymore, right? And, uh, you know, the first time I got called for uh, a jazz festival, it wasn't the Newport Jazz Festival, but it was the Newport Beach <laughs> Jazz Festival uh, in California. And uh, Tootie Heath was on drums and John Hurd was on bass. Mm -hmm. I knew both those cats uh from off the album covers 
And here, and uh, I'm just telling you, uh, that was another one of those life-changing experiences because I hadn't played with well-known cats up to that time. And uh, I remember one of the tunes that I really had to work hard with was Night in Tunisia because oh. they wasn't doing it in the key that I knew it in, of course. <laughs> Because uh, Melba Joyce, it was Melba Joyce's gig, uh, and uh, she was doing, oh, in C minor instead of D minor, where it's usually done. And I kind of knew the changes in D minor, I, even though it's just down a whole step, it, it, everything is different, you know, to yeah. me, right? But these cats really were swinging. Uh, the thing I really noticed about Tootie was he only had five drum pieces, man. He ain't had no whole bunch of drums, no whole Where bunch of stuff. He was wearing people oh, out five pieces. I'm, I'm trying to tell you, playing those five pieces of drums better than cats with 20 drums. <laughs> plus, plus Tootie could sing, too. I, I know that, but he didn't sing on this because, it's like I said, it's Melba's gig, you know, and, yeah. and uh, Melba Joyce well, actually, her name is Melba Joyce Bradford, uh, Terry Bradford's uh, wife. Okay. And uh, she just, she she wears out everything that she does. I mean, on her bad days, she's better than a whole bunch of folks on their good days, uh, okay. in my opinion. And uh, I was so thankful uh, that she called me for that gig. Because, you know, we're in L.A. It's a ton of cats she could have okay. called. You know what I'm saying? Cats. Yeah, bad cats. You know, <laughs> uh, and and the other big thing she did for me, I got to say, she called me. We did an album, uh, so you know how long ago that was. An album uh, with Dizzy and and Gerald Wiggins. Uh, so both uh, he and I were switching off on different tunes uh, on piano. And two things I learned on that session was Gerald had this uh, intro he played on one of the ballads. And I was like, wow, I never recognized that particular progression. It was dark, and but it was beautiful. And it wasn't busy. You know, he wasn't playing 50,000 notes all of it. I was like, wow, that's how to start this. Yeah. And uh, I learned that from him. And of course, when I got home, I learned to do that. Because <laughs> I, I just thought that was too cool. That was too cool. And uh, what I learned from Diz was we played this tune <clears throat> that uh, I thought Melba killed it. Uh, but she was very particular, very particular. And she uh, she said, uh, you know, I want to take this again. And Diz said, what? Why? <laughs> she said, well, I think I could do it better. He said, this is jazz. You sang what you sang. That's what it is. You don't need to do it again. <laughs> and I was like, wow, really? OK, you know. Uh, I was very thankful for for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me about. Uh, you know, I have to, I have to ask you now. Tell me Go about Della Reese. Oh my goodness! And I understand you were the well, the pianist and as well as the the musical conductor for her. Uh, as the kids say, it, this is what happened. <laughs> what it was was. <laughs> yeah, what it was was. I got a call on Thursday morning from an old friend of mine, <clears throat> singer, uh, William Knight. And he said, uh, Woody, are you working this weekend? And I said, no, I don't have a gig. He said, well, you know, I know you don't know it, but I've been working with Della Reese uh, for a couple of years and uh, she needs a conductor. She's doing the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra. Mm. And I told her I knew somebody. And I was thinking, now, I had conducted some, some pieces 
with some folks, but uh, never on the scale of the Rochester Phil. Uh, and he said, uh, could you come up to the house? And uh, and uh, take a look, you know, and see if this is something you want to do. I said, sure. I, she was at the top of Bel Air. Uh, so uh, we drove up to Bel Air. And she's, Della was bigger than life. Mm. Oh, what he was, you know. <laughs> I'm Della Reese, and the first thing you need to know is everything we do is serious. Yeah. If it's a note, it's serious. If it's a chord, it's serious. Mm. If it's a rest and it's silent, it's serious. You think you can handle that? And I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, what, what are we doing? She said, well, I've, I've got a show. I need a conductor. And I said, well, can I look, take a look at the charts and at uh, the score, uh, scores? And she said, well, I don't have. Them. And what I didn't realize at the time was a good friend of mine had been her original conductor, but apparently they had a parting of the ways and he had the scores with him <laughs> and he, they had to get them back from him. He, he took all the music? Yeah, well, he took the scores. They had oh. parts. And so I said, well, let me see the first trumpet part, the first violin part, at least to get an idea of what we are dealing with. And uh, so anyway, that's Thursday morning and the gig was Saturday. Mm. And so I, I looked at what I had and I didn't see the real scores until we uh, got to New York, uh, to Rochester, New York. And uh, it was a hundred pieces just about. Oh. Uh, Mar uh, Marion Alsap was uh, the assistant conductor. And she greeted me and uh, we talked for a bit, but I knew who she was. I had never met her, but I knew who she was. And uh, I'm telling you, uh, it was like going from uh, driving uh, a Ford Fairlane to get, jamming in a Maserati. <laughs> Just that quick. Just that quick. And the competence of this, of the orchestra was just phenomenal. I mean, everything I would have wanted them to play, they were playing, if not even better. And the arrangements were great anyway. I mean, it was great arrangements. Uh, Larry Farrell had done most of the arranging and uh, uh, the other Larry, I can't think of his last name right this minute, but there were great charts. And I was just awakened is the word, uh, cause I had never had that kind of experience standing in front of that many fabulous musicians in a great concert hall. It was at the Finger Lakes, uh, facility uh in uh, rochester it just blew my mind and and of course what really blew my mind we had never talked about money <laughs> i hadn't asked her how, what it was paying and she didn't say and we finished the concert we go backstage bam here's the check way more than i was thinking <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm like, oh, I like this because, you know, I'm used to doing stuff and you don't know when you're going to get the, the check or the cash or, you know, folks be fooling around. She was right on the money 100% yeah. of the time. And uh, when we did the rehearsal, I'm used to doing 
rehearsals, especially with singers, where they sing during the rehearsal. Okay, me too. She she didn't sing. She came out, took the mic, said blah 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 to me, yeah. and she made a statement, I think if I remember correctly, to the audience, she said, uh, I would like you to uh, give uh, my uh, new conductor a hand. She said, cause I think we're gonna keep him for a while. <laughs> and I was like, so it's all blowing my mind cause almost everything that happened was something that I hadn't expected. Fantastic. You know, um, and, and of course, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, and Della had tons of records that I knew, you know, uh, that she was singing. Um, and her voice was so magnificent. She could make it thunder and she could make it whisper at the same time. And she just took up all the oxygen in the room, uh, just about. She uh, and and what I some of the things I didn't know about her, she used to sing uh, with Mahalia Jackson. Yeah, yeah. And I really didn't know that. And she would tell me stories about her and Mahalia and going back a ways. And uh, you know, uh, the other thing that blew my mind uh, was. She got three quarters, not half, three quarters of her money up front before she left home. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, uh, Della. Okay. Yeah. And she'd get the other quarter when she got to the stage. So we never had nothing to worry about getting our money. Well, that's you know? wonderful. I loved it. I loved it. Well, let's talk about... Uh... Moving along here, and let's let's talk about your friend and mine, uh, Miss Marlena Shaw. Oh, <laughs> well, I just talked to her a couple of weeks ago. I called oh, she? her. She was doing better. She was doing better. She had been a little under the weather for a while, and she didn't she doesn't get out much anymore. Uh, the last two, two times I saw her was when she came to see my orchestra perform. Uh, and uh, the last couple of times that she did that, uh, once uh, she did it and we actually sang, uh, she actually sang a tune for me because I didn't, I wasn't trying to get her to perform. I just wanted to see her, you know? Uh, and the very last time, she came out. I didn't ask her to sing at all. And I told the audience that we are not asking Marlena to sing. We know she can sing and what she does. And uh, she was just such a lovely person on all top the of the fact that she could take almost anything and swing it. We talking about swinging? Even even uh, those uh, R and B ish kind of tunes uh, that she did, they were jazzy. She was yeah. swinging. Uh, she wasn't playing. Uh, uh, I can't think of the name of the tune now, of course. Uh, but the one where she did all the talking in front. Oh, go, uh, go away, away little, little boy. Yeah, yeah, go away, little boy. And all that stuff that she made up, that was so fabulous. So fabulous. Uh, Adela was very good at that too, though. Uh, she would tell these stories uh, before she did the tune to set them up. Her setups were incredible uh, and, and unbelievable. I mean, she could almost didn't have to sing uh, after she set it up so well. Yeah, it was done. By the time they get to setting it up, 
and telling the story, it's done. You know, I'm trying to tell you. I am trying to tell you. What about? Uh, I mean, you is so many. I got so much stuff highlighted here. And I only got <laughs> You know, I, I didn't read through everything, man. It's really exciting. <laughs> now let's let's talk. Let's move uh, to the East Coast and talk about your musical director with the Nova Scotia Mass Choir. How was that? What was that? How did you get into that? Well, I had a a need uh, to. Well, no, that's not right. Let me let me get this straight. I I got a call from uh, Curtis King. That, Curtis King. Yeah, your boy Curtis King. Uh, they needed uh, somebody to uh, play for uh, one of the singers uh, on the concert that we were doing at the Kennedy Center. Uh, for the 30th anniversary of the March on Washington by Martin Luther King. And I was available. And so uh, I uh, went to uh, DC and while I was there, uh, the Nova Scotia Mass Choir was late for rehearsal with uh, the band and the choir and everybody else because the bus driver that drove them down from uh, from Halifax got lost. Hmm. So they were a day or two late. And Curtis said, well, they, they can't sing. They don't know the material. And since I was only playing one song, which was Strange Fruit, hmm. I said, well, look, I ain't got nothing to do. I said, you find me a piano, I'll teach him the music. And that's how we met. And I was very impressed with them. Uh, they had a very unique kind of sound. And, <clears throat> and I asked them if they had any original material and if they were doing any recording. And they said, no, we don't. We haven't gotten to that. I said, well, I got a whole lot of gospel material. And I had, I had a ton of tunes. I had written that nobody had ever sung. Right. And uh, I said, uh, we ought to get together and do something. They said, oh, well, if you come to Nova Scotia, you know, uh, we'd love to uh, get together with you. So I got a call a couple of months later after the show. And they said, uh, we have a grant for you if you could come for a week and do a gospel workshop for us. And I said, okay. And I went for a week. And on the last day of that week, uh, they had a little concert that they needed to do at uh, the West End Baptist Church in, in Halifax. And they said, well, we need uh, a director. We don't have a director for the concert. Can you direct us? And I said, well, I don't know what music you're doing. They said, well, but we don't have anybody. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll see what I can do. I'll do the best I can. And uh, <clears throat> I called upon uh, one of the uh, strong voices in the choir, Jeremiah Sparks, uh, fabulous uh, instrumentalist, singer, and all around good guy, and uh, had him help me. Uh, go through the tunes and I did the best I could trying to conduct stuff I don't know. <laughs> usually that's all we can do is do what we can do. I'm trying to tell you. And it usually turns out okay. Well, it must have been all right. Nobody threw apples or oranges or <laughs> <laughs> banana peels at me. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, But after I had finished, clearly uh, God spoke to me and said, this is where you need to be. And I said, okay. I left the next day, went home, packed up all my stuff and moved to Nova Scotia. Okay. Didn't know where I was going to stay. Didn't really have a job. 
and everything worked wonderfully for almost 10 years. Uh, yeah, I was there. I think I stayed there almost two years. <clears throat> and then for the next uh, eight or nine years, I'd be back and forth five or six times a year, uh, you know, for weeks at a time or a month at a time. And we did concerts. We had a, a, a nice television show that we got, which really I knocked me out. Tell me about those TV shows you were doing up there. Well, we did. What happened was I was trying to do a show about uh, peace, world peace. So I wanted to use the uh, Nova Scotia Mass Choir, one of the singers that I knew, uh, uh, a Mexican -Amer American descent, uh, some some German musicians that I was working with, and uh, and this gentleman. Uh, Andre Brady, and he uh, was going to finance it. He said, "How much is it?" And I told him it was sixty. I needed sixty-five thousand. He said, "No problem," because he had he had the money, you know. And he came to he and his assistant came to Nova Scotia and saw one of our concerts. He said, "Oh, I love this. What do you need? What What do you want?" Well, <clears throat> unfortunately. <laughs> He got himself in a little bit of trouble. Uh -oh. uh, nothing, nothing criminal, but uh, and uh, the money was not forthcoming. But uh, CBC Television had already given me a week of uh, all the technicians I needed, the studio cameras, lights, everything, everything I needed to do the show. But I had to pay the talent. I had no money to pay the talent. Uh, and uh, one of the producers in uh, in Nova Scotia had the money, but he had no studio <laughs> and no, no equipment and da 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 So yeah. we made a deal. Uh, he said, I'm thinking about using you and, and your choir. And he said, uh, doing some kind of a show and we came up with the title hallelujah uh i designed a set uh and took it to uh their de set designer uh and i had all this material and that's how we got the first season on the air and we did 13 episodes in five days fantastic man fantastic. i'm telling you I, which was monumental now the second season of course uh it was more stretched out and we had a, a better facility more money uh better everything and uh <clears throat> well, are you still in touch with any of them there uh, most of the folks that i was close to i still talk to often and for quite a while i kept going at least once or twice a year doing things with uh, in fact when the virus started here, that I was just coming back from there doing a, a, some concerts. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping to get back there uh, in January or February if, if things have, uh, are milder and safer yeah. uh, and do some more things either with them or some of the other folks that I work with up there because I really have a family of folks up there. Right, and uh, right, right. and uh, they're very talented. They're some of the friendliest people I have ever met in my life. <laughs> I'm telling you. They, and I talk about that all the time. And I got friends that uh, there's uh, <clears throat> people right here in Vegas that are relatives to some of my friends in uh, in Nova <laughs> Scotia and in the choir. So it's a it's a big thing, uh, and it's a good thing. Well, I, I, I have a, another question for you. Can Go you ahead. kind of uh, tell us some of the things that you are working on? What's, what's down the line for Woody Woods right now? Well, I have a ballet that I wrote. 
that I'm uh, working on getting the funding for. Uh, it's uh, from a, a, a symphonic suite that I wrote that I'm adding poetry uh, and live musicians as well as recorded to uh, do the ballet. And it's a, it's a Black History Month kind of piece. Okay. okay. Uh, it tells the story of uh, the migration of uh, African music from Africa to America to the world. Uh, and kind of is spiritual. Uh, it's like Calypso. Uh, mm. There's a blues, there's jazz, you know, we got to swing. You got to swing, uh, man. <laughs> got you, to swing. you used to have a pulse, don't you? Yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, the story of uh, music, <clears throat> jazz, jazz music in Harlem uh, is involved in it and uh, history of the blues and just, just several things. Uh, runs about 90 minutes. Very good. And uh, I'm working on that. I'm going to do some recording uh, of a more quintet-like group. Uh, I haven't put it all together yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, well, I, and I, I have a book of poetry. Swing now. I, huh? I My middle name is still Swain. OK. <laughs> you know, I, I put the S in Swain. Okay. <laughs> as as, as well, we, uh, I was thinking about time. you. Say that again. I, was, I said I was thinking about you uh, the, uh, yesterday uh, because uh, on uh, what is it X Radio? What is that radio? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, XL Radio or whatever it is. They got Miles Davis for Black History Month. They got Miles Davis channel played nothing but miles davis all day long and i thought about you uh listening to them uh cats like philly joe and uh, and whatnot play and you were on my mind well uh i'm, I'm glad i'm on your mind doctor because uh it's, it's it's i think about you quite a bit a lot of those gigs we did a lot of them gigs we didn't get paid for still looking for the money yes so, right i remember that last one yeah. As we uh, as we as we kind of sum up, wind up our time. I'd like for you to, what advice would you give uh, some of the young uh, and up and coming uh, players today? Listen, as I told my friend uh, Jeremiah Sparks that I talk about a lot. Listen to everything. Yeah, because and and especially because I'm uh, listening now to this Miles Davis uh, channel. He he delve into a whole lot of different styles of music and still retained his personality. Okay, but you know he was playing some 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 rock. Uh, always swinging, some blues, some uh, African-oriented rhythms and songs and and whatnot, and uh, and I, I'm listening to him because uh, uh, they had uh, something they were playing something by a uh, uh, Joey De, De Francisco, uh, the the organist. Joey, you know De, Joey De, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, and I didn't realize, uh, even though I should have, Miles played organ too. I didn't know that. See, he played, and both of them play trumpet and organ. And uh, I never heard M Miles play like Jimmy Smith. It's mostly just some chords and some other things, but I'm sure if he wanted to, he could. Yeah. Because yeah. his, his grasp of uh, the vastness of music, especially through the eyes of a jazz player, uh, is 
it, it, it's just so many different things you can do. There isn't a limit. Uh, only the one that you make for yourself. You know, I I, I kind of have to agree with you when you say listen. That's one of the main things that I always try to stress when I get when I'm doing a lecture or a demonstration. Listen, listen, listen. Oh yeah. Uh, stay out the way <laughs> and listen. Well, <laughs> I, I I I appreciate to stay out the way. But see, I also like to get involved because I, I remember uh, this guy played drums. He swing a little bit, named Manny Kellogg, that uh, kept the solo going right past one when the singer come back and he's still playing it, <laughs> 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 which is legal. See, now, a couple of the brothers that was on the gig with us didn't understand, okay? They didn't get it. But see, I know that the drums need to have as much input into the personality of the music as anybody else. Right. You know, it needs to be that uh, for me. Uh, and let me say, let me, let me, let me say this about that. Um, a friend of mine out of New York uh, was talking about a friend of his that was a drummer and uh, that uh, his friend went to see Train one night and Elvin Jones was late. And mm -hmm. so his friend went up to, to Train and said, man, you know, I've got all your records. I know all your tunes. He said, if you want to get started with something till Elvin gets here, I, I, I can play it, whatever it is. And Train said no. And he went up to Train two or three times because Elvin was real late. And Train said no each time. So uh, as the story goes, Elvin came in. Instead of going to the stage, he went to the bar <laughs> and got, got a couple of shots of something. And kicked back the shots, and then went to the stage and got on the stage, counted off, and they burned, okay? Which, you know, that was, that was the quartet. That was my quartet. You know, I loved them guys. And so when the set was over, uh, the my friend's drummer uh, friend, you know, went up to train and said, um, you know, all those tunes you did, he said, man, I, I know all those tunes. He said, why wouldn't you, you you let me play a tune with you? And he said that Train said, because I didn't want to hurt myself. Hmm. And so not long after I heard that, because you know I'm an NPR junkie too, so I listened to NPR and they were doing an interview. Um, and I was listening uh, and they were interviewing uh, one of uh, Train's colleagues and he was saying that the thing that impressed him most about playing was Train. He said because he played like his life depended on it. All the time. See what I'm saying? And his yeah. thing was whatever you do, don't stop moving. See? And I'm, I, then I thought back to the 60s, the mid 60s, you know, when train was hot. And that's what I heard on those records. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Was those cats was playing like their lives depended on. Like they wasn't going to play again. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, sir. I got one. I got a couple more for you. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. You see, I didn't show it down. Now. <laughs> If I had, if I was to ask you right now, uh -huh. which I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who, who, uh, who are you influenced by? Who do you sit down and listen to, to this very day? Well, it's a, uh, I still, I, I got to go back 
Go ahead on. To junior high school, to Mr. Magruder, because nobody influenced me more in a short period of time than him. Because <clears throat> now, in, even in junior high school, in the band, when he would direct the uh, the marches, especially the ones uh, the six eight kind of feel marches, those kind of things, he told the bass drummer. He said, "When my hand gets three quarters of the way down." That's when you hit the drum, not when it's at the bottom. He said, because this has to swing. <laughs> that was, okay. He told me, uh, whatever you do, when you're writing your arrangements, put the third and the seventh or the third and the sixth in the trombones. He t he just, he had these, these bombs that he used to lay on me out of, out of nowhere. And he encouraged me by giving me opportunities to do things. Like he said, one one day I'm going to be out of school. I, one of the weekdays he wasn't going to be able to come. And he wanted me to take over beginning band and beginning strings. I mm -hmm. didn't even play no string instruments. I went and bought the books, uh, beginning, uh, beginning band instruments, these blue book, big blue books. I memorized every fingering for every instrument, okay, over the summer. That's what I did so that I would be ready because he told me way in advance. See what I'm saying? And so the combination of him encouraging me and giving me all these golden nuggets of stuff, right? And then Hearing and seeing all the bad cats, listening to all the singers, watching uh, people, you know, uh, how they grasp the music and, and stick their fingers in it and their hands and, and massage it and twist it and turn it. And 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 have control, yet all the freedom. You know, uh, I got a good friend here who thinks he he likes jazz, but he doesn't really like jazz, because he said if 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 they play stuff I can't sing, it ain't no good. You know, so he 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 loves Gene Ammons and hates oh. John Coltrane. <laughs> you know, and music is vast. You know, I uh, island music. Uh, I played with a, a, a Mexican American group uh, called uh, Los Hermanos uh, for quite a while, where I was one of the only two people in the band that spoke English. Really, I, I learned a lot. Now it wasn't the Latin from New York; it was the California sound which was completely different. Uh, and it made me aware of the fact that the claves are different on each coast. Uh, uh, on one, uh, in, on the West Coast is one, two, cha-cha-cha. On the East Coast is cha-cha-cha, one, three, four, cha-cha-cha, three, four. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that uh, until I had been on both, lived on both coasts and yeah, could yeah. hear the difference. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. It, it, it really does, man. Quite, quite a story, man. Really, really interesting. And uh, I would like for you to be able to uh, let everyone know uh, how, you can, how you can be contacted, your email and website and all that, if you don't mind sharing that. Well, my email, it's pretty easy. It's Woody, W-O-O-D-Y dot Woods, W-O-O-D-S at Hotmail.com. 
Uh, that's the best way to reach me. I'm going to leave my phone number off for now. But my email, I check it all day long to see uh, those big gigs that Manny Kellogg fixing to call me for. <laughs> and I'm on Facebook. Uh, okay. Yeah, Woody Woods, Las Vegas. I'm on. I'm on Facebook. I I, I I look at that every day. Not all day like I used to, but I try to stay stay up on that. And uh, my uh, son says I'm on Twitter. I don't oh, ever use it, <laughs> but I do see it come up. You know, if uh, you need to get in touch with me. But those are the. Uh, Give it problems. to us one Still more time. Sure. Give it to us one more time. Say again. Give it to us one more time. W O O D Y dot W O O D S at hotmail dot com. Fantastic. Dr. Woods, it's been uh, <clears throat> such an honor and a pleasure to be with this, sit here with you and reminisce and go back to yeah bring, up, bring me up to date and let me know what you're doing how you feel you look fantastic man man i'm you trying know. to keep up with you look at yourself <laughs> you're looking good got, your, say, beard, I'm, got I'm, your got your beard got your beard going and the whole nine yards as so, they say i'm just og now man that's all they call me every time i they keep calling me og and i'm thinking i hope that's good <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's, it's been a pleasure, and I truly hope we'll have uh, this opportunity again to yep. have, a, have a nice conversation. And uh, I'm going to ask you a quick, short question, and, and, and okay. I want you to answer real quick. What is jazz to you? The freedom to create. If you don't have that, it ain't jazz. If you if if you if you if you're not breathing what if you if you're not swinging no no if you ain't swing if you if you ain't swinging you probably don't have a pulse. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic man, it's a, it's a pleasure. Same here. You Same take care here. of yourself, man. You know I love you like a brother, man. And right on. I'm telling you the truth. I'm gonna to have to get out there on on that uh, West Coast, and we're gonna to have to sit down and, and swing until we can't swing no more one day. Well, you know I gotta get to the East Coast. You know I got a reason, so I'm coming. All I don't right. know when yet, but I'm coming. All right, you my brother. Take yourself, and we'll we'll uh, talk again soon. And you know I always end my conversations by saying, keep on swinging. <laughs> You too. All right, brother. Talk Take to care, you. Take care, man. Same here. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed the show and thank you for keeping jazz alive. Don't forget to follow us on our social media channels and all the links are in the podcast description. That's it for now. 